Okay, I think it gets ready to rock and roll. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this talk on, on Micronaut. Uh, great turnout. Good to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Graham Roche. Um, I'm the creator of a couple of frameworks that you may or may not have heard of, um, Grails and Micronaut. Um, I work for an awesome company called Object Computing as a principal engineer, uh, where my full-time job is, is open source projects and software and building great open source technologies. And, and it's a pleasure to be part of the team there that does all these great, great things. Um, in 2018, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be awarded the inaugural Oracle Groundbreaker Award uh, for contributions to the Groovy and Grails community, and, and that's, that's awesome, and thanks for the kind folks at Oracle. Um, I live in, in El Pais Vasco, which I'm sure many of you have been to. Um, my wife is from the, from the area. I've been living there for 10 years. So I could probably do this talk in Spanish, but um, not Catalan, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, I've been uh, living in, in Spain for quite a while now. And uh, I'm excited to be here. First time uh, at the conference, and it is awesome. So on the agenda today, we're going to look at like, the challenges facing Java and software in general when it comes to adapting to microservices and, and serverless uh, models versus traditional models. I'm going to do some talking, I'm going to do some demos, and we're going to have questions, and hopefully you, you're going to have fun. Um, so serverless challenges, and microservice challenges in general. Uh, Java in general uh, is, you know, has, is challenging to use for, for um, serverless in particular, um, because uh, you know, in general, existing tools and frameworks out there that we've been using for the last 10 years or so, um, I'm not optimized for cold starts, nor for low memory footprint scenarios. Um, <clears throat> so, and if you look at like other technology stacks like Go and Node and so forth, they're generally better in this regard when it comes to um, cold starts, memory consumption, and so forth. And you have like important people, you know, like Tim Bray saying, you know, oh, Amazon AWS saying, no, no, don't use Java for serverless. Uh, but that's because a lot of their opinion is based on existing technology stacks that we've been using the last 10 years, which it is true, they, they don't start up particularly fast. If you look at something like, like Spring or like, like um, Java E or Jakarta E, whatever you call it now. Um, and um, we as an industry have to be adapting to you know, serverless models, um, microservice models. Serverless, for example, is all about like how fast can your application start up from cold starts? And often, it's, you know, things like that we traditionally think about, like connection pools, are kind of irrelevant because what's the point of maintaining a pool if it's just going to go away, right? <laughs> There's no point. Uh, so you have to kind of really reconsider how you architect your application, even things like local caches and so forth. And you have to choose technology based on your cold start requirements. So you have a whole different like set of technological concerns. Microservices as well, um, you know, cold starts are not as important, but still pretty important. Um, the container is the deployment unit, and you know, containers in Java require special integration. Only just recently have we got the right Java flags to for Java to do proper memory management within a container, and um, you have to you know, optimize memory usage for Java. And if you look at how traditional frameworks work, so this is like traditional uh, frameworks that, are, uh, that most people use today over the last 10 years, like for example Spring. Whilst Spring is an amazing technical, technical achievement, uh, what it does to do the magic that it does is essentially uh, you know, reads the bytecode of your class files at runtime um, so that it can figure out, is this a bean? Can I inject it? Is this an, an AOP proxy? aspect oriented, can I inject it? And it synthesizes new annotations for each annotation on every bean, constructor field, and sketcher to support what's called annotation metadata. Um, and it builds all of the rules that are kind of reflective metadata by analyzing your classes at runtime. And um, this is a, a, a massive problem if you're trying to achieve low memory. So uh, when we looked at this problem when designing, designing Micronaut, we were like, hmm, Tough decision ahead. We want, we want to, you want to kind of use existing technologies because we love them. We love Spring. We love, we love Grails. We love, you know, existing technologies. 
but are they really optimized for what we're trying to do? Can we achieve the low memory requirement? Can we achieve the cold starts with traditional frameworks? And as it is uh, with Micronaut, we decided that that wasn't possible due to this kind of micro reality where frameworks based on reflection um, and annotations become fat very quickly. Um, you know, and it, it's an unavoidable problem, and I'll talk about why it's an unavoidable problem in a minute. But, you know, we love the programming model. We love how Spring makes things easier. We love how these technologies make our lives easier. But, you know, we can't, so we kind of live with this problem, even though our, our application is suboptimal and using a heck of a lot of memory and, you know, not very efficient. But the question is, why, you know, why shouldn't we be more efficient? Why can we not build applications that are memory efficient in Java? It just doesn't, it doesn't seem right that we have to build applications that suck two gigabytes of memory. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, and there's this definite correlation with you know, traditional frameworks between the number of lines of code in your code base and your startup time and your memory consumption, where as you, your application gets bigger, your startup time goes, gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and so does your memory consumption requirements for your application. Um, and you're kind of left with a lot of choice, and a lot of people have been going to these kind of smaller frameworks to try and resolve this problem where you, you choose things like Vertex, fantastic framework, by the way, Vertex, toolkit, not framework, um, Ratpack, Spark, Java, et cetera, and you, try, and, and you go to these guys because they give you those things that you want, the low memory consumption, the startup time, et cetera, but you kind of sacrifice all the developer productivity that we love. You know, developers love the developer productivity of Spring, they love the developer productivity of Grails. They love these, these technologies, how much they do for you. Um, so it's kind of a hard thing to go, go back down here and say, let's you know, use these toolkits when the really high productivity frameworks are the ones up in the top right corner. Um, and why, why is it technically impossible to build um, a framework that consumes little memory uh, whilst using reflection? So, and what problems does Java offer? Well, Java, Java is amazing, and you know, it has some amazing APIs, but they're actually pretty limited when you look at them in detail and you try and, try and build a framework on top of them. So if you look at, um, for example, the annotation API in Java, it's, it's, it's nice, but it's pretty limited in that, for example, take a simple example. You have a, a controller class, or a, a service implementation class that implements an interface that extends from another class, and it, there's a method on it. Yeah, and you want you want the annotations on that method, but you also want all the annotations on the interface that the method implements, and the annotations and all the annotations on the class, the method, method that it overrides in the superclass. Suddenly, you have a framework problem. You have to get the method from the class. You have to get the, in, in, the interface that it implements, that, that it overrides. You have to reflectively look up all this logic. Uh, you have to try and, try and somehow fuse that inf annotation information into one view, because you want the annotations from the super, super interface, from the superclass, from the class that implements it. And you want to kind of gather all this annotation into one view. And you have, to pervert, you have to perform this incredible reflective magic, which is what like, something like Spring does to create annotation metadata. Um, and you have to do it all at runtime, which is a, is a raw computational cost. Um, type erasure as well. Uh, again, JVM, great. You know, but with the addition of generics, a big deal for developers. But for framework developers, generics was like, oh, shit, why? Now I have to deal with type erasure. Now my, this class that you're telling me this, this field on this class, this field that I declared, that is a list of string, when I get the field on the JVM, that I no longer know it's a list of string. <laughs> and that, that type information is gone. I, some, I then have to use a special reflective API, which is like a uh, parameterized type, and it's different whether it's depending if it's a field or a method or whatever, and you have to try and how resolve and figure out that this, this thing actually, this list takes a string. Yes, and you've finally figured it out, and you've written like you know, thousands of lines of framework code to figure out that this list on this field takes a string. It's incredible the amount of work required to, 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 do, uh, um, to deal with type erasure. Slow reflection as well. So reflection is slow. The, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's slower than calling code directly. That's just the reality of, the, of, it, of it is. 
And, it's, and because it's slow, um, you know, it's not just slow in terms of calling a, a class, it's also slow in terms of retrieving the reflective data. If you want to retrieve like methods and so forth, it's really like slow to analyze a class at runtime. And to solve that problem, the JVM creates caches. So it caches reflective data. And um, these caches, uh, you have the JVM's cache for the reflective data, but then you have all the libraries in the world creating their own reflective caches. If you look at a typical Java, Java stack, like, for example, you have one reflection cache for Hibernate. You have another reflection cache for Jackson. You have another reflection cache for, for Spring. You have another reflection cache for... Every, everything has a reflection cache because everything needs to do reflection. So it's like a never-ending, impossible problem to solve in terms of memory because you have these reflection caches everywhere. Um, and class path scanning. Oh my, <laughs> like Spring and, and pretty much any kind of Java technology that needs to load, dynamically load, uh, you know, visits all your, the jar for classes in your jar files, uses a ASM to analyze, is this thing annotated with what? Uh, it's just slow. Um, and dynamic class loading is slow as well, you know. So it becomes problematic f for framework developers because there are limitations that are not, that are there for a reason, but from a framework developer's perspective, it's challenging to actually build a framework on. And you guys probably don't see this because you're the consumers of a framework. But us poor souls that have to develop frameworks, like Rails, like, <laughs> like Spring, like Micronaut, get to see all of this detail. So um, another question I tend to ask is, you know, imagine if Kubernetes or Docker, both tools that we run locally on our desktop, on our laptops, or on a laptop like that, were written in, in Spring or, or Jakarta EE. We would, we would all need, we would all need, like, we'd need one of these for a laptop, yeah? To, you know, both of those systems are essentially a cluster of microservices, yeah? Written in Go. Go consumes very much, each process consumes like nothing. Um, so you can have loads of them. And, uh, and you, don't need, you don't need one of these for, for a laptop. So, and why is it like that? Um, so, and, you know, why is reflection a problem? If anybody comes to you in t and, and they have a framework out there, or a tool where, from, what, from whatever, whatever other company, I'm not going to name names, and says that reflection is not a problem, uh, point them to, uh, to this line in the JDK. This is the, this is the line. So it's, in JDK 8, it's line 2471 of, uh, this is the open JDK source file. And you can see there that this is the reflective data cache inside of a java.lang.class. Java class. And it's stored as a soft reference. And it's initialized as soon as you access any reflective data. So it doesn't matter if there's one field, doesn't matter if there's 10 fields, doesn't matter if there's 100 fields or one method, or t 10 methods, or 100 methods. As soon as you access the reflective data cache, you are occupying memory for all 100 methods, all 100 fields, yeah? Regardless of whether you actually use all 100 fields, or 100 methods, yeah? So if, the, if somebody says that reflection doesn't cost memory, point them to this code because it's a lie, yeah? This, this, is, this is fundamentally the problem that we face, that Reflect, uncontrolled reflection is a problem. Um, so, but having said all of that, you're probably thinking, why are we using, even using Java? Um, and um, you know, Java's problems that I've just been going over, they seem pretty grave. Why, do we, why are we even using this thing? Well, Java's problems are also greatly exaggerated. Java is and has been dead forever. Uh, killed by various technologies over the years, whether it be Ruby or whatever or something else. And Java can be fast. It's been proven. See Android and Micronaut, for example. Um, however, most tech existing tools are based around these three t technologies that exist in the JDK, which is reflection, runtime proxies, and runtime bytecode generation. And if you're trying to achieve memory consumption, these are enemy, public enemy number one, these three. Um, and, um, but Java has many, 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 and many, many more advantages. It's a mature, robust ecosystem, outstanding IDEs, diversity of IDEs, the code maintenance that it offers, the refactoring, developer availability, the build system maturity, the di diversity, mobile IoT server-side 
you know, it's used everywhere. And serverless and low memory for microservices are not everything. It's not all Java, right? Java is very broad, rich language ecosystem with Java, Kotlin, Groovy, Scala, etc. So, you know, there's, there's nothing, there's really, you know, people saying, why don't you just do something else? Well, there's really nothing better than Java, fundamentally. <laughs> um, and, you know, by the time something like Go, as a language, has all the features of Java, Java's run startup time performance and memory performance will match Go. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. So, um, and also, you know, this is not new ground that I've been discussing. This is an already solved problem. You look at Android, yeah? Android has exactly the same requirements. Low memory footprint devices that need to start up fast, that, you know, an, a user of an Android phone doesn't want to wait, you know, minutes for their, their app on their phone to, to load, when, even if they have a, a low-powered device. They want the, the app to load immediately. Um, and ahead of time, compilation is already used extensively in Android. You know, Google Dagger, for example, is a dependency injector for Android. Um, it's reflection-free. It's limited in scope because, you know, they're only thinking about mobile devices. It's not like a full server-side stack. But, you know, this, this is ground that's already been tread. Um, so I just mentioned ahead-of-time compilation for the first time. So what is ahead-of-time compilation? Uh, well, you hear fancy phrases like the pre-computation of your application clo code using closed-world static analysis. Whatever that means, I don't know. Uh, it just means that you do more work at compile time and less work at runtime. Right? So instead, let your compiler do the job that your application would otherwise have to do at runtime. Yeah? So, um, and that's where we, we, we approached Micronaut, is that we need to think about completely changing the way we build applications for the next 10 years, instead of like dealing with the same problems that we've dealt for, with, with for the last 10 years. And, and Micronaut is, is essentially a, a microservices and serverless focused framework, that's true. But it's also a complete uh, application framework for any type of application. You can build microservices, you can build serverless stuff, but you can also build CLI applications and or whatever. And features integrated dependency injection, AOP, configuration management, bean introspection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, it's it's completely based on AOT, so ahead of time compilation. So all dependency uh, injection and configuration is ahead of time computed. The annotation metadata that I was talking about before, where you want to figure out all of the annotations from all the interfaces, we compute all of that for you at compile time. So you don't the framework doesn't have to go searching for for um, for annotations. AOP, so we have full support for AOP, aspect-oriented programming. For those of you who don't know what AOP is, have you ever used at transactional? Yeah, so at transactional, exactly, that's an example of an AOP advice. Um, we support all of those same constructs. Only difference is we compute those at compilation time, so there's no runtime created proxies, there's no reflection. Um, Everything that is framework infrastructure is compilation time, computed at compile time. Um, essentially, what Spring and, and CDI do at runtime, Micronaut does it during compilation. Um, and uh, like I said, Micronaut is not just about microservices. You can build microservices, you can build serverless applications, you can build message driven applications that have no UI and are just consuming Kafka or RabbitMQ uh, messages. You can write CLI applications. You can even write Android apps. We have it running on Android. Um, even the Micronaut HTTP client works on Android. And um, you know anything with static void main really is a candidate for Micronaut. Um, and um, you know, so what is it really? Like I said, it's a it's a fr application framework for the future, where we try to eliminate all the the, the problems by 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 building on what we learned on, learnt whilst we built Grails. So uh, no reflection, no runtime proxies, no dynamic class loading, ahead of time a APIs are exposed. So if you want to do your own ahead of type, time compilation, it's there. And uh, also, yeah, it lets you build microservices. That's true, too. Um, so uh, Micronaut has had a massive impact. Uh, we announced it, in fact, a year ago, tomorrow. I think, 
a year ago tomorrow was when we first, um, no, no, in March was when we announced it, but we open sourced it a year ago tomorrow. Uh, so the first time we open sourced it was a year ago. And it's really sparked um, industry-wide um, improvements and, and kind of revolutionized the way people start to think about server-side applications. So Red Hat have come up with something called Quarkus, uh, which follows a, 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 a similar approach. Um, Pivotal have been uh, attempting to optimize Spring Boot's startup time through lazy beans and uh, et cetera. Um, so Micronaut has really had this massive impact of encouraging everybody to be more efficient um, and really change, changing how server-side Java is, is perceived. Um, before, we, uh, before, we actually started building Micronaut two years ago, in fact. And we never even knew or had heard about Graal VM. Um, and uh, so we were like a year into building Micronaut and this thing called Graal VM popped up. I was like, wow, this looks really interesting. This is doing kind of what we're doing. Uh, but by taking it that next step further by computing your application into a native image. And you know, we looked at the requirements that, that for native image in, in Graal VM and the requirements were Basically, you know, if you use the more reflection you use and the more runtime, more runtime dynamic your application is, then more, the more difficult it is to get to run on Graal VM. You have to generate more data and so forth. And it actually turned out that Micronaut was a great fit for Graal VM native because there's no reflection, there's no runtime proxies, there's no dynamic class loading, there's, no, there's nothing that really violates uh, what, what Graal VM is asking for, for you to do to run on Substrate. And I must mention that Graal VM is much broader than just a native image. Uh, it, it's gone G, it's got, Graal VM 19 has gone GA recently, although the native image stuff is still experimental. Um, but anyway, it works well with Micronauts. So you can get startup time of 20 milliseconds and memory consumption of 18 megabyte with, with uh, Micronaut paired with Graal VM. Our Graal VM support is evolving. Um, the same way Graal VM is evolving. So, we, so Micronaut, is, Micronaut itself is production ready. We're at 1.1.2. We have lots of people using it in production already, including the app that is running the conference. Part, part, the app that's running the conference is written in, in Micronaut. Well done. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, the, uh, the, we have lots of production use. So, uh, the Graal, so the Graal VM support for Micronaut is still regarded as experimental. That part is experimental, but, but Micronaut 1.1 is GA and, and ready to be used and, and so forth. So that's enough talking and chatting and describing. Now let's do some demos of actually fun stuff and like demo. So I'm actually going to do something quite daring this conference in that um, I'm going to attempt uh, to use a new IDE called, called uh, Visual Studio Code. I don't know if you've tried any of it, you tried it. And I'm going to try to use Maven as my build tool. Usually I use Gradle and IntelliJ. So this could go horribly wrong. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, but we're going to see. It's going to be fun. <laughs> we're going to try and build something. And hopefully it all works out. So um, Micronaut uh, comes with a command line tool called MN. You can install it via SDK man. And it's just an application generator. So I can say Micronaut create app. Greeting service, and I can say I want to build a Maven build, and uh, I'm actually going to say I want the Graal native image feature um, because I'm going to you know do some Graal stuff afterwards. And there's my greeting service application, and I'm going to open it up in Visual Studio Code. And hopefully this all goes uh, to plan. So this is my this is a Micronaut application, and uh, if I open up the application class, there it is. You'll see that uh, very much like uh, Spring Boot or something like that, you have an application class that you can run, um, which just has a static void main. And I can run this uh, either via, um, via IntelliJ uh, Visual Studio Code, just by running it like that. Or, um, or I can run it uh, directly 
from the terminal window, which is, uh, you can say maven and w compile exec exec, and that will run my, run my micro application, start it up, and you can see that startup time is, uh, for a you know, simple app, 800 millisec 793 milliseconds. I have my application up and running. Um, but you know, this app doesn't actually do anything yet. Uh, just pointing out the general um, Visual Studio Code support is really nice, actually, uh, whilst I'm here. You can you know, open up application.yaml, and in here we get like uh, code completion for server slash host, you know, for all the configuration options or port, uh, and, you know, and you can go configuring things. So they have really nice support in, in, in Visual Studio Code. Micronaut doesn't really need much IE support. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new um, uh, a new file here, and it's going to be greeting controller java, and we're going to have package greeting service, and it's going to be a public class greeting controller, something like that. Um, Oops, I should probably name it correctly. Otherwise, that's going to be problematic. And we're going to have a controller, and it's going to map to greet. And we're going to say, uh, we're going to want to return like some kind of uh, greeting. And it's going to be a package greeting service. And it's going to be a public class called greeting. And we're going to have some text that we're going to use to greet. Then uh, we're going to generate, get and get, get and set up for that. Um, Micronaut has a, a nice uh, utility annotation called introspected, and what it does is it lets, uh, if you apply it to like a POJO, it allows um, reflection-free bean introspection onto the POJO, so there's no reflection to do getters and setters. So I'm going to add that there. And I'm going to say get, and I'm going to say name, to a path called name. And I'm going to return a greeting from here, and I'm going to greet the person that has that name. And I'm going to return a new greeting, like that. And we're going to extract it into a variable. And we're going to say the greeting is going to be greeting set text hello name. There we go. That's my greeting controller. <laughs> And um, uh, what I'm going to do now is write a, a test for it. So we're going to come into my test a, a directory here. And we're going to create a, a new, where is my test directory? New uh, greeting controller test. And it's going to have a package. Oops, that should be. Rename Java. That should be a greeting service, package greeting service, and it's going to be a class that is greeting controller test. And this is going to be a Micronaut test. We have a Micronaut test annotation that makes it easy to set up. And we're going to uh, we're going to inject um, a client that has a path to the reach URI. And it's going to be an Rx HTTP client. And we're going to write a test. And we're going to say uh, void test greeting. Oops. And we're going to say um, client uh, dot retrieve HTTP request dot get. Uh, what was it again? Greet slash name, greet slash Fred, and we're expecting a response back of type greeting, and uh, we're going to extract that into a local variable, which is going to return my flowable. So, say that that's going to be my result. Then we're going to say assert equals uh, hello, who am I greeting? Fred, 
uh, result dot blocking first dot get text no not get text save okay so that's uh, that's that's my test uh, we run the test and we see what happens and if the demo guards are with me uh, no that that didn't work. Oh, somebody is, is awake. Yes, that would have been a, a very fatal mistake uh, if that had. So let's try that again. Yay, so we have a, a working uh, greeting controller. My tests are passing. Uh, I can also uh, you know, go back to my uh, console thing. And I can run my app uh, if I want from from here. Uh, I can go to a browser and say, you know, localhost first greet slash Fred. I mean, you know, there's my response. So I have, you know, my initial implementation more or less working uh, how I expect it to. So uh, one so one of the things we typically have in a typical app is that. Um, you know, you have DI and dependency injection and so forth. Uh, so, with Micronaut, uh, you can you can you know create, for example, a greeting service dot Java, and you know you can have it in a package that is a greeting service, and the, and this can be my class uh, greeting service, and this can be a singleton bean, and uh, we can. Uh, instead of like doing an actual greeting in here, uh, we can say, you know, have the greet method in this guy. That actually returns my implementation. Uh, then you can, for example, have a private final greeting service um, variable here that you inject and, you know, create a greeting control, create a constructor that in injects the service. Uh, and this is my greeting service. Um, and then in, in here we can say, instead of doing all this logic in here, you know, we can say greeting service dot greet name. And uh, more or less that's going to, you know, give me the same uh, overall um, behavior. Instead, instead of, you know, instead we're just using DI uh, to implement the um, the functionality, and uh, you know, in this case, I'm I'm injecting what is Micronaut's low-level client, which is based on Rx Java 2, uh, but it exposes Reactive Stream, so you could you know use Reactor with it as well, or whatever. And I'm I'm saying like retrieve or get, but Micronaut also has a uh, declarative uh, built-in uh, client, so I can say greeting client dot Java. I can say package greeting service and create an interface here. That is my gre greeting client. Uh, and this, this guy is going to be a client and it's going to talk to my greet endpoint. I think it was greet, right? Greet, yeah. It's going to talk to my greet endpoint. Um, it's going to make a, a get request to with with my name vari variable, and it's going to return the the greeting object that I'm, you know, attempting to communicate with. And uh, it's going to be an interface. And then in my test, uh, instead of uh, doing all this business, I can just say uh, inject a greeting client. Um, and you know, instead of all this business, I can just say greeting client dot greet red and extract that into a variable uh, and just say greet dot text and we can run the test again where my test is yes here it is. Oh, what, what am I failing to do here greeting client cannot be resolved to a client can't be resolved to a type Really? Well, let's try and run that with uh, 
Maven W test out of interest and see if that gives me a. OK, well, I, that's obviously some Visual Studio code thing, but it is working, my test execute. And notice as well, like my test execution time, like one of the big things about Micronaut and one of the big changes you go through in you know, adapting to Micronaut is tests execute instantly. Like if you're writing functional tests or if you're writing um, tests that are like, you know, how often do we make the decision in, in, as Java developers, actually, I'm not going to write a functional test for this because my app is too slow to start up. Yeah? People, that shouldn't be a decision factor. That shouldn't be a decision. You shouldn't be making a decision, should I write a functional test that actually spins up my app uh, versus should I write, not be writing that uh, based on how fast your application starts up. That, 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 that means there's something wrong with the, the architecture of your application. Tests, tests run instantly with Micronaut. Um, they're like unit tests. Functional tests become like unit tests, and you write better tests, more comprehensive tests that exercise you. There's nothing like, uh, you, you probably can't see it here, but you know, if I add, if I enable uh, logging in logback, uh, and I say uh, logger name equals io dot .http .client, I say level equals trace, uh, and then I come back to my uh, uh, terminal window, and uh, and I run my test again you'll see that uh, my, this is my full application spinning up. Uh, I'm sending actual HTTP requests. There's, 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 there's nothing mocking happening here. There's no mocks uh, in Micronaut. In fact, we, we purposely do not have in Micronaut mocking libraries or libraries that mock things. If you have libraries that mock things, that's a sign that there's something wrong. Um, you shouldn't have libraries that mock things. You should be able to spin up your whole infrastructure, your whole app, and then you should be able to test it, and I shouldn't need mock MVC. That, that, uh, mock MVC is the, is, why, do, why does it exist? Um, it doesn't make sense to me. So uh, this, this, this just you know, it spins up, it executes as fast, it's efficient, it's quick, and um, I'm not waiting around, uh, you know, and, th and this also Im even influences like people end up not writing tests. I, you know how many projects I come around and say, you don't have any tests? Yeah, we don't write tests because, you know, they're too slow to run. And then, you know. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so, um, Micronaut, fast tests, uh, and efficient. So, uh, that, you know, I've, I've built like a, a pretty interesting application here already. You know, it has. Uh, dependency injection, it has a client, it, it has an interface that's a client that talks to my server. Uh, dependency injection, um, I can apply all sorts of AAP and keep, keep this going, but I think this is really pretty cool. Um, and then, what, you know, once you've, uh, once you've taken it, uh, built your app, uh, you can see that, you know, to build it into, I can just maybe even package it up, um, which is going to run my tests again. Uh, and um, you know, then I can Java jar and run it. You know, as a standalone mi microservice, and it's there. It runs. It's fast. It starts up. It's quick. And um, then, if I you know want to take it to the next level, uh, I can say SDK uh, list Java. I can never remember what these Java distros are called anymore because uh, they keep. You know. And this is this is Graal. So I can say SDK use Java. Java. Growl, then I can say stuff like, uh, then I can say native image, uh, no server, because the server just consumes lots of memory, class path, target slash chart, and then build that guy into a, build it into a, um, into a Growl VM native image. Um, and once, w this process can take some time. So we may, about, we may as well start talking about something else um, in the meantime. I think we should just talk about something else because this, this process is going to we're going to we're going to be watching the compiler for like two three minutes here. So if anybody tells you there's no disadvantages to Graal VM, just bring them back to my talk and watch this part of the talk because the big disadvantage to Graal VM na native is that here we are waiting for the Graal VM substrate native image tool to compute my micro app into a native image, and we're going to be waiting here for a significant period of time. 
And then once, once it's computed into a native image, it's runnable locally, but remember that you have now lost, lost write once run anyway, so you can't run it anyway. You can only run it on this Mac, on a Mac, on a, on a Darwin-based machine, or, or you, if you wanted to run it on your Linux server, you have to compute it with Docker, and you know, specifically with the environment that you want to run it on. Um, so there's various you know, disadvantages to, and trade-offs that you have to make uh, when you consider to use something like a substrate, uh, a native image, apart from the fact that uh, substrate and native image is still very much experimental and evolving. Um, however, having said all that, it's really exciting technology. It's really exciting that you can do this and that uh, we can compute a Micronaut app. Um, and once it's actually finished to, uh, computing, um, then uh, the end result uh, is, is, a, is essentially a natively optimized image um, that will start up uh, on this machine in milliseconds and, um, and consume a fraction of the memory. So there's, th there's a trade-off there that you have uh, that you have to think about if you're considering this technology, that you have to consider, um, is it worth it? Um, and uh, there you go, it's done. So I managed to talk all the time. Good. So you can see when I run it, it starts up in 25 milliseconds. Uh, if you look at the actual process, I think it consumes like 14 megabytes, which is you know more like Go territory and so forth. But even if you don't, even if you don't use this technology, Substrate, Micronaut is awesome because it optimizes Java to the best it can possibly be. Yeah, with Mi with Micronaut, your startup time is sub-second with Java, consumes around 80 megabyte of memory for a 70 to 80 megabyte of memory for a process, and which is still a significant boost over your traditional app, which consumes like gigabytes of memory. Um, okay, so that's that was the demo. So yeah, that was an example of Hello Micronaut. You know, controllers, easy programming model. Um, you know, decorative clients, key thing about the client stuff, computed at compile time, no runtime proxies involved, everything reflection free, um, zero reflection. How small, the smallest Micronaut Hello World app when you build it into a jar file is 12 megabytes. So again, you know, you compare that to traditional stacks when you build your wall file and it's like a 30 megabyte jar or a 40 megabyte jar. Again, there's benefits there. I can actually run my app in as little as 10, 10 megabyte of heap. So, um, uh, so you, you know, if Graal actually, Graal's virtual machine actually uses more memory than, um, than Oracle's one, uh, than the regular JVM. Uh, but basically, you know, I can say Java slash jar target uh, greeting service, and I can limit the memory, and I can say, you know, I, know, I only want to use a max heap of seven megabytes to run this jar. And you'll see that uh, it still starts up, it still starts up fast, and the, the application is still uh, functioning perfectly within the limits of seven megabyte of max heap. Like a regular Java app, you need like 32, 64, uh, sometimes 128. Uh, you need a lot of memory. Micronaut can run on the baby Raspberry Pi, it can run in low memory footprint environments, it's very, very efficient. Um, and we, it's only efficient because, like I said, we're not using reflection. If we were using reflection, we'd be the same as everybody else. Um, so uh, startup time is sub-second, all DI, AOP, proxy generation happens at compile time. So uh, cold starts, you know, on OpenJDK, open as you saw, you know, you're looking at around 800 millisecond uh, cold start and around 80 to 90, sometimes 100 megabyte memory usage for like a simple app. Um, for if you go, to, there's some really interesting happen, stuff happening in the OpenJDK community. One of them is Eclipse OpenJ9, which is the, uh, IBM's J, JVM, and they have a class sharing feature, which is much easier to use in the built-in one that comes with OpenJDK. And when you use that, Micronaut's startup time drops to 300 milli, milliseconds. This is not native. This is regular Java, and uh, memory consumption goes down as well to you know only 70 megabytes. So that's already approaching. You know, do you need substrate <laughs> uh, if you've got 300 milliseconds startup time already? That's already good enough for a lot of use cases. Um, of course, if you go the Graal native route, then yes, you get 15 milliseconds startup time and very low memory consumption, but with some significant disadvantages that you must consider. Um, 
it when evaluating any, any technology. In fact, you know, even Micronaut has, this is, I'm not going to tell you Micronaut is this like golden, Micronaut has disadvantages. Micronaut's compile times are slower than your regular Java framework, like Spring, or because we do stuff at compile time. We pay the cost for the compiler so that your app is faster run time. Yeah? Uh, again, on AWS, Micronaut has dedicated AWS Lambda support. A simple function starts in 300 milliseconds. API gateway style app starts at 800 milliseconds. You, we even have a custom runtime for Graal that does 150 millisecond startup times, cold starts on AWS Lambda. <laughs> Micronaut 1.1 is out already and ready for production. Uh, it's production ready. 1.1.2 is the current version. In this latest version, we have gRPC and GraphQL support as well as RabbitMQ support, improved Kafka support. The project is healthy. It's really you know, exploded onto the scene in, in a year. We've gone to 2,350 GitHub stars. Uh, we've had loads of external contributors. There's so many people excited about it. Um, we have more excitements and exciting announcements in, in 2019. And for the locals in the audience, it is. You know, we have th uh, four folks, uh, th three in Madrid, uh, me and the, the north of Spain. It's effectively made in Spain. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, exciting. Uh, exciting project for f folks local here. And, you know, we're all around the corner, the Micronaut team. So if anybody here needs help or needs questions, we're all around. Um, Lots of resources. We have a Gitter community, user guide, uh, all sorts of stuff. I'm going to leave time for questions. So in summary, Micronaut and Graal VM are pretty much the leaders of the AOT ahead of time compilation revolution. Uh, Server-side Java is adapting to the serverless world and in becoming more efficient, building better applications, more efficient, lower memory, faster. We're making things better. And um, AOT sacrifices compilation speed, but you gain so much more in terms of the performance of your application. And you know, by using, choosing something like Micronaut, you leave, leave the o option open to go like native with Substrate or GraalVM in the future. So Micronaut is already pretty compelling, and we have a lot more coming. So that's, I have left three minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Q&A. <laughs> Any questions? If you have like simple serverless cases, it, it can be can be something that's usable now. But it, it, currently, Graal VM native is very much it's regarded as experimental by the Graal VM team or early adopter status. It's regarded as experimental by the Micronaut team. Some of the areas that come out of it are very hard to decipher, and it, it's very hit and miss when it comes to third-party library support. But it's exciting technology that has real potential. Uh, to, and has a lot of. I hope that one day all the, the, the Java libraries out there add Graal via metadata and it becomes like a deployment tool. So you say to your cloud infrastructure, you know, compute this. So you're not running it locally because running it locally, as you saw, it takes forever. You say to your cloud infrastructure, compute my uh, Java application into a Graal native image on demand in the cloud uh, when I need it. But for that, it needs to get better and, and run more types of Java applications. And it's still a little way from that. Um, and, and, you know, it, it'll get there, and Micronaut will be there to support it. But it's, it's not there in 2018, <laughs> I would say. But it's nonetheless exciting, compelling technology, and some people are having success with it already. Yes? I'm wondering if, some, if there is some sort of approach for clean architecture, for example, in the service you have built, you had to put the add singleton in there. But if is there any way to keep the framework out of the of the production code and just put it on configuration similar to what the Spring does with AdBin? So add singleton is uh, for one add singleton is actually more standard than Spring in that it's the annotation from JavaX.inject. So we use, you're not add singleton is not. Um, is not like a, a Micronaut annotation. It's, a, it's a, an annotation from the JavaX.inject uh, TCK spec, yeah? which Micronaut supports. So wh when I say at Singleton, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a, f a dependency on Micronaut. I have a dependency on the, on the JavaX.inject spec. 
And the, it, the other feature that we have in Micronaut, which is really nice, which I didn't talk about, is because we do everything at compilation time, we have the ability to map any annotation to any other annotation at compile time. So we actually support all of the spring annotations. You can use at bean and at, uh, at configuration and all of the spring annotations, and there's absolutely zero runtime cost because all we do is translate that annotation to our annotation at compilation time and things work the same at runtime. Uh, so w we have plans to support more specifications like javax.validation, Java, potentially JAXRS, potentially other things in the future, uh, more standards um, as we evolve the framework and take it forward. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, there's nothing Micronaut specific that you're doing. Um, and, and actually that's exa exactly what, you know, Grails is 4 is built, ha has Micronaut built in, and we're using the spring annotations with Grails 4. And it works the same. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, can you give an update on what the current maturity is in Micronaut to uh, you know, um, support these kinds of side projects? So, we already have uh, support for Kafka, support for RabbitMQ, and ma mainly around messaging. Um, we're working on data support right now. And uh, people have, it's actually our biggest feature that people have asked us for the most is I won't really want to use Spring Data in, in Micronaut. And what I've been telling people is that. Um, uh, we could add Spring Data support, but y directly, like just using Spring Data and setting it up, whatever. But Spring Data represents everything that Micronaut is trying to avoid, right? Runtime proxies, reflection, high memory, slow. It's like a bundle of stuff that we're trying to avoid. So it would be kind of like, <laughs> point, I mean, it's possible, technically possible, of course. So we're, we are working on that right now. And actually next month, no, what month are we in? July, sorry. July, we will have an announcement around data access. And we're excited about it. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Well, I think we're, we're done, we're out of time, and probably... Um, Oh, yeah, what, one thing as well before anybody goes, uh, before I just want to say, I will answer your question, is that I do have Micronaut stickers, a whole bunch of them. So if you want stickers, and you, you do come, come to the stage, or come meet me afterwards, and there's one on the floor as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Just no question. Uh, Micronaut offers out-of-the-box support for Java, Groovy, and Kotlin now, which yeah. is nice because other frameworks don't mm. do that. Uh, is this this plan to to keep that support, or at some point maybe they, you will focus on some specific language to ensure, for instance, the new features and new? No, we are fully committed uh, to those three languages. In fact, we 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 also want to support more languages in the future. So actually, it's actually going to expand. We do want to support Scala, um, uh, and it's just a matter of write, writing a, a Scala uh, compiler plugin. Which I say is just a matter of writing, writing <laughs> but, but it's, it's actually pretty complicated. But <laughs> but, uh, but we do want to support Scala because we don't we don't want to exclude any JVM ecosystem system, and it actually pains me that we don't support Scala. So we're not dropping support for Groovy. We're not dropping support for for Kotlin. We continue to take that forward. And actually, for Kotlin, we would like to improve the experience for Kotlin users. Currently, we use CAPT, which is the Kotlin annotation processor support. We would like to write a native Kotlin plugin because there's certain subtleties that you can't see through the annotation processing API. Like, is this, uh, is this like optional? Is it a uh, data class? Is it, you know, there's certain things that are difficult. Um, so yeah, we only see that expanding. That's, that's Stickers, <laughs> do you come? <laughs> <laughs>